So I'm going to be uh, reading, uh, starting from Psalm uh, 138, verse 2. And the, the topic, actually, that I want to address this evening, or this morning. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, I want to talk, address the topic of Jehovah Witnesses. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. And, uh, this is an important one. You know, I think Jehovah Witnesses, they have a pretty strong influence down here in Tucson. And... Uh, you know, it's something that we need to be aware of. I don't, I don't think we have anybody in here that, uh, you know, is a, is a closet JW, you know, or anything like that. But sometimes it's kind of good to know a little bit about uh, false ways that out there. Make no mistake about it, by the end of this sermon, you'll know that, you know, the Jehovah Witnesses are a false way. You know, we're living in an age right now where everyone wants to say, you know, all paths lead to God, we all worship the same God, and... You know, uh, that, that nobody uh, wants to offend anybody else. But, you know, I, the Bible says, you know, I, I hate every false way. You know, and, and of course, we never want to hate people that are involved in a false way. You know, it's not anything we have personally against people who are claiming to be Jehovah Witnesses. We, we care about those people. We want those people to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. But the Jehovah Witnesses, as an organization, I, I believe is very wicked. It's very demonic. And the reason I believe that is because they're teaching things that are contrary to the Bible. And not only that, but, they're, but because of what their, their, their false gospel and their false Christ, um, they're damning many souls to hell. And it's a very unfortunate thing. But before we begin to talk about uh, any of the doctrine of the Jehovah Witnesses, and we're only going to look at a few of their doctrines, um, we have to establish an authoritative source. You know, it's kind of like I've heard it alluded to, you know, before you start any game with Scrabble, you got to get the dictionary out and say, this is our authority, right? Mm -hmm. And say, we can't go on the internet, we can't go on Google and, and look up some weird word and, and see if it's used. you got to have a, an established source that you're going to use as your authority. And of course, here uh, at Faithful Word, we use the King James Bible. We believe that this is the final uh, authority in all faith and practice, all matters of faith and practice. Anything that we do or teach should find its, its roots here in the Word of God. And if it doesn't, you know, it needs to change. And if it's something that's contrary to the Word of God, it needs to change. So that's something that we should all be willing to do in our own hearts and in our own lives, you know, but especially when it comes to, to doctrine. We should allow the Bible to always correct us and always let our doctrine line up with it and not try to make it line up with us. And the reason why I had you turn to uh, Psalm 138 is I want you to see how much uh, the... the uh, the emphasis that God puts on His Word. The premium that God puts on His Word. If you look there at verse 2, it says, I will worship toward thy holy te the temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Now get this, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. So God here in this, in this verse, when, when this was written, you know, the Psalm of David, and the Holy Ghost, you know, uh, working through him, writing through him, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he said that God's word was exalted above God's name. And you know, one of the first things we'll see about Jehovah Witnesses is they're all about the name Jehovah. They, that, is their, that is their bread and butter. That's what they go after. If you ever run into a Jehovah Witness, if they ever come to your door, a lot of times one of the first things they want to talk to you about is, what's God's name? You know, like God has one name. Like God's name is Jehovah over and over. And they'll, they'll, they'll criticize the King James Bible and say, you know, why have you taken out the word? Jehovah out of your Bible. And we're going to talk a little bit about why we have those word, the, the word Lord in all caps versus Jehovah in, in our Bible. Well, first thing I want us to understand is that when we're going to talk about doctrine, especially when it comes to this doctrine about what God's name is, that God is saying his word is even more exalted than that. So if you're going to run into somebody who says, oh, God's name is the most important thing. Well, God said in his word that his, that his word was even exalted above that. So we ought to take the Bible very seriously and, and let it be the authoritative source when we're going to talk anything about uh, doctrine or spiritual matters. Of course, Jehovah Witnesses, they get this completely backwards, right? They, they, don't use, they do not use the King James Bible. In fact, they use, uh, somebody actually got this, so when you guys got this out, so when it came in handy, they use the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures, and that is the 2013, I believe that's the most re recent edition of it. It's been revised several times, but this is what they use. They don't use the King James Bible. I've read several articles off their website. We're going to look at some of them this morning. Sometimes they'll quote the NIV. Every now and then I, I think I might have noticed where they, they quoted the King James. But this is their go-to source. It's not the King James Bible. And let me just say this right now. This is not God's Word. 
This is a very uh, poor translation. I, can't, I don't even know what you call it that. It's like they just made up whatever they wanted when they wrote this. And I really don't want to go into it, but because I've already established the fact that God's Word is His final source. And we know that the King James Bible is God's Word. That God has promised to preserve His Word, that God had, had, and has done that. So, one thing I want us to notice, if you would turn over to Genesis chapter 1, just to kind of show you that what they are basing their doctrine on, doctrine on is, is shifting sand. They are not founded upon the rock of God's Word. They are founded upon the shifting sand of the New World Order translation. So if you would go to Genesis chapter 1, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to show you an example from their own book where they get something, uh, a very grave error, in my opinion. <laughs> You're there in Genesis chapter 1. Let me get over there with you real quick here. What version was that? that this is the New World Order translation. Yep, the NWT. This, and it will be referred to from uh, going forward in the rest of the sermon as the NWT. You know, just a little... <laughs> A little lawyer leaves there for you. So it says there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, And the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was on the, uh, upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So here we see the Spirit of God moving upon the face of the waters. And of course, we here believe in the Trinity, that God is three persons, uh, three, three, uh, three persons and one God. We believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And when he's saying the Spirit of God here, he's actually referring to the Holy Ghost. And the, J, and the JWs, they get this way off, right, right out of the gate. It says this, I'm going to read to you. You can follow along in Genesis 2 and, and see how well this lines up. It says, Now the earth was form and de uh, formless and desolate, and there was darkness upon the sur sur surface of the watery deep, and God's active force was moving about the surface of the waters. So here they're not calling it God's Holy Spirit. They're calling what the King James Bible calls the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit. They're actually calling it the, an active force, God's active force. Now, that, that's, that's quite frankly, that's blasphemous. And I've gone, you know, and I don't want people to think that I'm just making all this up. So I have actually gone and gotten several articles right off the Jehovah Witness website. Because a lot of times you'll confront somebody who's claiming to be a Jehovah Witness. You say, hey, do you know the Jehovah Witnesses teach X, Y, or Z? And they'll say, no, they don't. They don't teach that. Well, you know what? This is the JW.org little copyright right there. I didn't take the time to Photoshop this and make something up. You can go to JW.org. Anybody who's in doubt about this, you can come see me after the service, and we can look it up on a smartphone, and I can take you straight to this article that I'm going to read from. And I'm going to read from several other articles that all have this nice little blue square that says JW.org. This is right off of their, <coughs> their own website. This particular article... It's called, What is the Holy Spirit? Now, right there, that should throw you off a little bit. They're calling it a what, a thing, not a who. Mm -hmm. They don't believe that the Holy Spirit is an actual person. They believe it is God's active force. It says here, what is the Holy Spirit? The Bible's answer. The New World, uh, the NWT's answer. It's not the Bible's answer. The Holy Spirit is God's power in action, His active force. He sends out His Spirit by projecting His energy. So they're saying that God's Holy Spirit is not a person, but it's actually God's active force. It's His Spirit. It's Him projecting His energy. Now, I, that sounds to me, I don't know who, anybody, when I read this, the first thing I thought of was Street Fighter. Remember Ryu? Who <laughs> played like Street Fighter? Come on. You know, like the 80s kids, 90s kids. You know what I'm talking about. And he was, you know, Haruken! And he would go, like, oh. that's what, exactly what I thought of. Like, that's what they're making God into. Like, he's just some video game character, just like, Haruken! Throwing yeah. out his active force, you know, across yeah. his waters. God is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. Right. Yeah. He's not just some active force. You know, like, it made me think about, like, Star Wars. Right. You know, the force. This impersonal... Uh, you know, intangible just thing, you know, and it's a lot of, if you get into Eastern mysticism, you know, that's what this all goes back to. I remember before I got saved, I read a little bit about Taoism, you know, that goes into, you know, talking about how, you know, when you get to the source of all things, you know, it's just this impersonal force, you know, it's not, a, it's not a person. So they say here that God sends out his spirit by projecting his energy. It goes on and, and, and says a lot of other things in this article. I, I only want to focus in on a few things here. But it says here, it goes on and says, point, point blank, the Holy Spirit is not a person. Now, in case you didn't catch that from what their own translation says, 
and from the title of the art article, and then they just come out and say it. And what's amazing about the Jehovah Witnesses doctrine is that they're very open about what they believe. They'll just put it out there. It's, it's not a mystery. They're not very cryptic about it. They're not like the Mormons who don't want to tell you that they believe in another planet called Kolob and that you know, dark-skinned people were actually bad spirit babies and, and that heaven for women is just eternal, you know, being you know, eternal being pregnant, giving birth, you know, it's all these weird doctrines. The JWs are actually very forthcoming on their webpage. Sometimes you kind of have to look around a little bit, read several articles, but you know, it doesn't take much to really get to the, the, the crux of what they believe. And mark it down, they don't believe the Holy Spirit is a person, they believe it is a force. It says, by referring to God's Spirit as His hands, His fingers, or breath, the Bible shows that He is not a person. Well, and this, this is a huge, just, let me, let me just come out and say, this is blasphemy, with what they're teaching. They, they use a lot of uh, bad um, reasoning and they're, and they're thinking through this. Uh, one thing they address here, it says, misconceptions about the Holy Spirit. This is one of their supposed misconceptions. The Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit, is a person and is part of the Trinity, as stated in 1 John 5, 7, and 8, in the King James Version of the Bible. So here they are. They're going to start to attack the Bible that claims that God, the, the one that God has lifted up above all his name. Now they're going after it. They're making no bones about it. That they're about to tell you that the King James Bible is an error. And, 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 and particularly about this matter of the Holy Ghost is what they're going to start to attack the King James over. That's the misconception. They're saying that if you believe that the Holy Ghost is a person, if you believe that the Holy Ghost is a part of the Trinity, as stated in 1 John 5, 7, and 8, in the King James Bible, that you believe in a misconception. Okay. That you have a misunderstanding of God's Word. That you have a misunderstanding of who God is. And this is what they state as fact. They state fact. The King James uh, Version of the Bible includes at 1 John 5, 7, and 8, the words, In heaven, the Father, the Word... And the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and there are three that bear record, bear witness in the earth. So they're quoting the, the Bible there, and they go on and say, however, researchers have found that the words were not written by the Apostle John and do not belong in the Bible. So they're saying that 1 John 5, 7, and 8 don't belong in the Bible, that they were added later, that the Apostle John didn't write those things. So you can see already they do not believe in the preservation of God's Word. They don't believe that, that God, who created the heavens and the earth, who, by, whom, by whom all things consist and have their being is able to just write mm -hmm. something as simple as a book. That's right. I mean, anybody can write a book these days. Don't you think God could write a book? I mean, God could write a book and preserve it for all generations. Yeah. We believe that. We believe that by faith. Amen. And you know, that's not just a complete, complete blind faith. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of good reasons, a lot of you know, evidence of why we believe that to be true, that the Bible is inspired and preserved. Now, I won't go into all of that, but you know, they are attacking the King James Bible here by saying that 1 John 5, 7, and 8 do not belong there. And then they, they quote Professor Bruce M. Metzger, who is a very, you know, scholastic, very, and I believe a, a Presbyterian. So this isn't even a Jeho Jehovah Witness that they're quoting. They're, they're reaching outside of their own ranks to try to bring somebody in who has all these, I looked this guy up, just very scholarly, lots of, you know, academia behind his name and just you know, a lot of works. But a guy who, who attacked the King James, a guy who attacked... Um, the, the, the inspiration and preservation of God's word. He said that these words are spurious. That's a big fancy word, spurious, that you have to look up if you don't know it. And what it means is fake or false. So you don't want to just come out and say, these words are fake. These words are false. Because that sounds a little harsh when you're starting to talk about the Bible. Mm -hmm. To say it about the Bible, that there's something in the Bible that is fake or false. No, you want to use a word like spurious. <laughs> you know, to kind of, kind of soften the blow. And have no right to stand in the New Testament is certain. This guy was certain that these words do not belong in here. And that's why, you know, the, the, the Jehovah Witnesses were glad to hang on to that guy, this, this statement, and reach out and say, yeah, now we got somebody to stand behind us. They go on and say that the Bible personifies the Holy Spirit, and this proves that he is a person. This is another misconception that they have. This is say, they say, this is the misconception, okay? The Bible personifies the Holy Spirit, and this proves that it is a person. Now, we would say amen to that. We'd say, no, that's exactly right. The Bible does personify the Holy Spirit because it speaks about him as a, as a singular person in the, in, in the male as a he. You know, gender, as a he, yeah. exactly, thank you. And it says, they're saying here that that is a misconception, that if you believe that, that you are in error. Now, they go on and try to support this by saying, this. They say the scriptures do at times personify the Holy Spirit, so they're not denying that. 
But this does not prove that the Holy Spirit is a person. The Bible personifies wisdom, death, and sin. And that's true. The Bible does say in Proverbs 1 and, and Romans 5, it talks about death and it personifies these things. You, talk, you think about in the book of Proverbs saying, you know, I wisdom, you know, cry out, cry out to the simple ones that pass by. How long ye simple? You, you know, and you, you have these verses where it's wisdom is speaking, right? It's personified. Well, this is bad logic to sit here and say, well, because wisdom is personified and the Holy Spirit is personified, if so facto, neither are a person. That, that's a false dichotomy. That is a false dilemma that they have created. That is bad reasoning. That does not stand up. Uh, either way, you know, they're, what they're saying, what they're prevent, presenting you with that option is saying, either they're all persons or none of them are. Well, how about this? How about, how about one speaking figuratively and one is speaking literally? Is that not an option? They're trying to present you with two options and say those are the only options. Either wisdom is a person and the Holy Spirit is a person, or neither of them are. Well, you know, the, that, that, that's just bad reasoning. That's bad logic. It goes on and says later in this article, we'll move on here from this, they say uh, another misconception. Jesus' apostles and other early disciples believed the Holy Spirit was a person. Yeah, they sure did. You know, that's a misconception. You didn't know that, right? The Jehovah's Witnesses would tell you you're wrong to believe that. They say the Bible does not say that. Well, you know, I would challenge them to go ahead and turn over to John 15, 26, John 16, 8, and John 6, uh, 16, 13. And look what, how they address the Holy Spirit as a He. At, they give a name, the Comforter. When He has come, will guide you into all truth. He's somebody who can guide you. It's not an active force. It is a person that is coming. It says, fact, the Bible does not say that. Well, in fact, it does say that. And it goes, and they go on and says, nor does history. So now they're going to appeal to the fact that, you know, and I didn't really look into it, uh, what, what, you know, whether or not somebody in history has said that the, the Holy Spirit is a person. I'm sure there's somebody out there somewhere, you know, that wrote a book and said, yeah, the Holy Spirit's a person because we've read the Bible and understand it. They go on and quote the Encyclopedia Britannica, they say, which reads, the definition that the Holy Spirit was a distinct and divine person came at the Council of Constantinople in A.D. 381. This was oh, over 250 years after the last apostles died. Well, what do you call this when they say, well, you know, the, the, they say, well, history doesn't say that he's a person anywhere, you know. That's what's called an argument from silence. And that's, that's bad reasoning as well. You can't argue from silence. You can't base something based on a fact uh, on what something doesn't say. You know, you have to go and look at what it says. And when you look at those passages in John, it makes it very clear that the Holy Spirit is a person. Yep. So why do you say, why is this such a big deal to harp on them about the Holy Spirit? Well, <clears throat> to personify the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, or de-personify him and liken him onto a New Age concept. That's what this force thing is. This is a New Age kind of mystic concept. Anybody who's, you know, dealt with the New Age or, you know, looked into those things, this New Age religion... You'll hear things like this, the force of God, or this kind of talking, this kind of thinking, where they're just trying to liken God into this impersonal being who just has a force. This is a, uh, unto a new age concept, such as an active force, this is nothing short of blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. I believe that what you're reading there in this book, in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 2, is blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. That's right. Because what are they doing? Well, they're taking the works of God, God, the Spirit of God, moving upon the face of the waters, and attributing it unto this active force, yep. this New Age God. They are attributing the works of the Holy Ghost to another. Yep. And the Bible says, I'll read to you that, uh, from, uh, and go ahead and turn over to uh, uh, Psalm chapter 12, Psalm chapter 12. Make no mistake about it, when a person begins to attribute the works of God, the Holy Spirit, unto another, Especially some false god or some false way. That is blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. It says in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said, said in verse 31, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither, and neither in this world nor neither in the world to come. So and this is another great text to prove that the Holy Spirit is a person because you can blaspheme the Son of God, you can blaspheme the Son of Man, and you can also blaspheme the Holy Ghost, which is exactly what they have done. Now, I'm not going to say, get up here and tell you that every Jehovah Witness you run into is as blasphemed the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to say that. 
But I am going to say that the people that sat down yeah. and made up this translation mm -hmm. and got to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 and decided to call the Spirit of God an act of force had blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Yeah. And that's my opinion. You can disagree with that. That's fine. Okay. But that, that's, I, I, I uh, you know, woe unto them that have produced mm -hmm. this wicked book right, right here. Right. <clears throat> and you say, well, you know, how can you be so short up on, on you know, saying that, you know, the King James Bible is the only accurate, you know, uh, Bible that we have in the English speaking uh, world. Well, you're there in Psalms chapter 12. I'll read from Psalms 119. The Bible says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So God has settled his word. I mean, and don't you think God has the ability to get his word out to all people? I mean, God who wants all men to be saved. I mean, of course, he's going to tell us how it is that we're going to be saved. So, of course, he's going to give us a way to understand who he is and what he, what he wants us to do. And he does that through his word. It's settled. And it says there in Psalm chapter 12, verse 6, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So that's a promise of God that God is going to preserve his word to every generation. Where is it today? Where is it today if it's not in the King James Bible to the English-speaking people? Where is it? Where is it gone? Was it buried somewhere in some desert, in some pottery? For thousands of years, and we were just, you know, blindly following some false version. All these, uh, until it came along, and we just st stumbled upon it. Do you think God's that, uh, that God's that, you know, He's that uh, short-sighted and incapable of preserving His Word to give it to us? You know, at the end of the day, we believe the King James Bible is the Word of God by faith. You know, I, I, I make no bones about that. I'm not going to say at the end of the day we say, well, why do you believe the King James Bible is the Word of God? Because it says it is. That's why, and because it has power. You know, when you read the Word of God, this book right here, the whole God will speak. If you were born again, saved, and you pick up this thing, this book, you know, the the the, the, the witness, the, the God's Spirit bears witness with your spirit, mm -hmm. and you're moved by the things that are in this book. Go read this book and tell me if it ever moves you. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe maybe you might want to make it throw up some of the stuff you read in there. That's about it. Yeah. Make you shake your head and and, and say, who can, who's who's writing this? Who's believing this? <clears throat> now another. One of the, uh, of course, and this is like their big go-to doctrine for Jehovah Witnesses, is, is that uh, the name Jehovah. They'll ask you, you know, why does the King James replace the name Jehovah? <laughs> and really, this is, and you know, we talked about when it was about the Holy Spirit, about uh, the logical fallacies that they use. And this is one of the most effective logical fallacies that they use. And what it is, it's called an appeal to ignorance. Because the fact is, a lot of people don't know why the Bible uses Lord. Why it took out the word Jehovah and it's using the word Lord in the Old Testament. But here's the thing about that. when You, you can't just appeal to ignorance because ignorance isn't proof of anything except that one doesn't know something. You know, Just because I don't know why doesn't prove that, that it's right or wrong. It just proves that I don't know it. So that's not any type of, uh, you know, any type of a, a winning argument. Now, I'm going to go over this very briefly and try to keep this as simple as I can and not spend a lot of time on it. There's other really good sermons that have been preached about this topic. Uh, I, if you really want to know more about it, I would go listen to Pastor Anderson's sermon. Uh, uh, the, the Name of God was one, or he did The, the Names of God. He did a two-part series. So there's three excellent sermons right there. You can go on the website and search those. You know, there's other things that I want to get into in this sermon. So for the sake of time, I'm going to move a little quickly through this one. But it's, it does, uh, why does the King James replace the name Jehovah? Well, the word Lord there in all caps is what they call the tetra, tetragrammatron, which just means a four-letter word. You know, just tetra, four, right, grammatron, or grammar, right? Four letters, that's all it means. It's just four, and basically what it comes down to is there are four consonants in the Hebrew language. That if you were to go back in the Hebrew, and when you see that word Lord, you would see these four consonants in the Hebrew language. Now, you have to understand that when they, the, the Jews back then, they had this, this tradition, they had this, uh, you know, this man-made tradition that they would never pronounce. Every time they came to that word, uh, Jehovah, they would never pronounce it. They would, and they, you couldn't even write it down. If you ever wrote it down, you could never erase it because they would say, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Yeah. You know, but that, that's a misunderstanding of taking the, Lord, the name of the Lord thy God in vain. What it means when you should take the name of the Lord like I mean is you should just use God's word, you know, flippantly. You know, OMG. You know, you're going on Facebook and saying OMG, that's taking God's name flippantly. That's taking the name of the Lord in vain. That's just using it as some expletive, right? We see that a lot. That's what the Bible's talking about when it says you should not take the name of the Lord like God in vain. 
You should use the name of God as a cuss word to express your disdain or frustration. You shouldn't take God's holy name and bring it down to that level. Right. But they, they, they got this wrong, so they wouldn't even pronounce that word. And as a result of that, no one today knows how to pronounce that word. No one knows. They not say this big debate. Is it Yahweh? Is it Yeshua? Is it this or that? And, you know, I believe from what I've learned and, 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 and heard preached and, and looked into that the, the name Jehovah is the closest thing. You know, and if we were to go to somebody else in another language, they might say it a little different, like Yehovah or Yehovah. You know, I think it's how they say it in, they say it in Spanish. Now, what they did is they replaced it, translators, they replaced that, uh, that, that word with Adonai, which literally translates into the word Lord. That's the actual translation. And then later on, they actually added vowel markings to those, that four-letter consonants. And, and uh, those were added by scribes during the Middle Ages, and that's how we got the word Jehovah. So that's where that comes from. But, uh, you know, one, one thing we need to understand is that this, this tetragrammatron never appears in the New Testament. That word that gets translated all caps Lord in the Old Testament never happens in the New Testament. Because that is a Hebrew word. And now we are dealing with Greek in the New Testament. So the question is, you know, when Jesus and the apostles are quoting the New Testament or the Old Testament, or using the name Lord to describe God and not Jehovah, you know, are they wrong? You know, they're using the Greek word Kyrios. And no, they're not, right? Because Jesus is infallible, right? He, of course, he would, he would get the name, the name of God right. So... <clears throat> If you would, go ahead and turn over. I'm having you turn two places. Go to Psalm chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. Psalm chapter 2, I'll give you a second here. Psalm chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. This is a really good example of Jesus Acts 4. Acts 4, yeah. Of somebody quoting the Old Testament in the New Testament. And they don't take the time to correct the Old Testament when they quote it. They just read it like it says. It says there in uh, Psalm chapter 2, it says, Why do the heathen rage? First one, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth themselves set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying. So there you have the Lord. And also, you know, we also see that the Lord and anointed, those mean the same thing. You know, God goes by a lot of different names. He goes by a lot of different titles. The Lord, Anointed, Christ, Messiah, Jehovah, King of Kings. Or, I mean, God just has multiple, multiple, multiple names. To say that he's all about this one name. Yeah. And if you only use, and the, and the Bible does use Jehovah seven times in the Old Testament. It's not like a name, never use it. Now, if you're looking at Acts 4, they actually quote Psalm chapter 2. In uh, so Acts chapter 4, it says in verse 25, Who by the mouth of uh, thy, David's ser thy servant David ha has said, Why did the heathen rage that people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So here they are in the New Testament, looking back and quoting the Old Testament we just read, and they didn't, they didn't go, oh wait, that was wrong. We've got to make sure we say it Jehovah. No, the translators translated this, they translated it Lord again. So this, you know, this is kind of a light, just going over this topic kind of lightly because there's more grave and more serious things uh, that the Jehovah Witnesses believe. I, I think that are, are far more damning. You know, the, whole, the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is pretty bad right out of the gate. Yeah. You know, that kind of shows you right there that the, the spring is corrupt. But, uh, you know, on this issue of the name, I'm just going to trust the Bible. I'm going to go ahead and side with Jesus. I'm going to go ahead and side with the apostles, like Peter here, yeah. who's, who, and, and the translators of the Bible who took the time and all that effort and, and work and knowledge and ability that went into and, and working of God that gave us this, this translation right here, that they got it right to use the word Lord. So I'll go ahead and side with them. Now, if you would, turn over to Philippians chapter 2. Because here's the thing about that name, Jehovah. They, they, and we're going to get into the next topic about the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's kind of a segue into it. <clears throat> they translate that word Lord. Now, when you read this, a lot of times, most times, in fact, there's a few instances when they don't translate Jehovah into Jehovah in the New Testament. 
They only use Jehovah in the New Testament in the, in the New World Translation. But there's a few times where they actually will use the word Lord. And it's interesting to see when those times are. What passages they prefer to use the word Lord instead of Jehovah. Which is, you know, that, that's their big thing. You've got to use the word Jehovah. That's the name of God. So it's interesting to see where they don't use it. If you look at Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. This is, of course, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a certain servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. <clears throat> Which is another thing they don't believe in. They believe he was crucified on a stake. I didn't have time to go into that. It says here that he was, he was the death of a cross. Wherefore, God also hath the highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. So what's the name that's above every name? Jesus. The name Jesus Christ. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth. That every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Now there, they don't say Jesus is Jehovah. They don't say that. They, they go and let Lord remain Lord yeah. in that passage. Because if they were to say that Jesus is Jehovah, they have to admit that Jesus is God, which is another thing that the Jehovah Witnesses do not believe. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. They might say that he's Lord. They'll say, oh, he's the Son of God. But they do not believe that he is God like you and I. When we say Jesus is God, we believe he's every bit as God as God the Father. We believe he is God every bit as, as God the Holy Spirit. They do not believe that. <clears throat> Another place that they left that out is in Romans 10.9. I thought this was interesting. It says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So you see these, there's a few verses where they're referring, where you know it kind of looked like, well, this might, if we say Jehovah here, we're going to call him Jesus God. And Philippians 2 is, you know, that's a real, that's a real tough one for them to get around. And if they're even bothering to try and get around, they might, I mean, it really, when it comes down to it, they, they really don't mind admitting the fact that Jesus isn't God. In fact, I have an article on that as well about who Jesus is. I'm going to get that out right now. And again, as you can see, this is right off their website. I'm not making this stuff up. <coughs> so, <coughs> you see, G, the JWs, they leave Lord in these texts uh, that would otherwise call Jesus God or, or, or Jehovah. And they call Jesus Lord, but they do not call him God, right? And they plainly state that Jesus is a created being, okay? They do not believe that Jesus was, you know, from everlasting. They believe that he is a created being. That's what it says right here in this article from JW.org. It says, who is Jesus Christ? Unlike any other human, Jesus lived in heaven as a spirit person before he was born on earth. He was God's first creation. So right there. They're admitting right here, plain as day, that Jesus Christ is a created being. That God created Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he is the only one created directly by Jehovah. So at least they'll give him some you know, reverence or honor there. Well, he's the only one that Jehovah made. But the point is, is that he made him. You know, and God is not, is not made. God is from everlasting. You know, God is not a created being. So if you're going to say Jesus was a created being, you're essentially saying he was not God. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to spend a whole lot out of that article, but they call him a, a, uh, a created being. And this article goes on, and there's others here that we're going to look at. And they say, well, you know, Proverbs 8.22 is what they'll, they'll, they'll quote here. They'll go into Proverbs 8.22 if you want to turn over there. And this is their proof text to prove to you that Jesus Christ is a created being. And what's crazy is a lot of times when they're, they're core doctrines... They go to the just the, you know these these passages in the Bible from the, a lot of times the books that are considered books of wisdom, books of poetry, like books of Ecclesiastes, like we're gonna look at here in a minute, and Proverbs. They're never turning to like you know the epistles and, and you know very often and just finding a clear verse that just plainly states what they believe. There's just yeah. a lot of well the Bible you know says this here, therefore it's a lot of conjecture is what they have. And if you look at Proverbs chapter eight in verse twenty two. I'm going to read to you from, from this. You can follow along in verse 22. Jehovah, this is from the New World Translation, produced me at the, as the beginning of his way, the earliest of his achieve, achievements of long ago. So he says there that, because here it's talking about wisdom, right? It's wisdom that's, that's personified here. And of course, that's a picture of Jesus Christ. 
that he was from the beginning. But what does it say there in Proverbs chapter 8? It says, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways. Now, is being possessed the same as being produced? No. No, it's not, not at all. Just because I possess something doesn't mean I produce something. Right. It just means I, I have authority over it. Yeah. Which is a, another great picture of the fact that there is a trinity in the Bible. Yeah. That, that there is a authority structure within the trinity. That, that uh, they all have the same, same mind and same will, but there is an authority within that structure. That the Son has to be obedient to the Father. <clears throat> it says there, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his work of his old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or wherever the earth was. So that's just talking about how we could say that, well, this is referring to the fact that Jesus Christ is from everlasting. Yeah. That he was there with the Father from the beginning. And, uh, but that's not what they believe. They believe that Jehovah created him. They say he was produced. They say he was an achievement. You know, like a trophy buck. You know, or, or something like that. Some game animal that he went and packed or something. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. It makes no sense when you compare it with other scriptures. Go ahead and turn over to... Uh, uh, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. When we start to compare it with other scriptures, this doesn't make any sense at all to say that he was a created being. Because Jesus Christ is the one who created all things. All things. Amen. Everything. Right. Not just everything except himself. It says all things Amen. were created by him. Ephesians chapter 3 says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the, of the mystery from the, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Yes, it was God. Jesus Christ is God. And it was by Jesus Christ that all things were created. Amen. Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 16. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven. That would include Jesus, wouldn't it? That are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, or all things were created by Him and for Him. So if Jesus Christ created all things, he certainly didn't create himself. So it just doesn't make any sense to say Jesus Christ is a created being when he's the one that created all things. <clears throat> now what's also interesting um, is that the New World Translation translates Lord as Jehovah. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not even going to get into that. It might just get a little too confusing. <clears throat> You know, if Jesus Christ, another point that we could point out, you know, to, just to prove the deity of Christ, is if Jesus Christ isn't God, then why did he not, why did he not refuse worship as God? Right. And we see that several times in Scripture. I mean, there's multiple, multiple passages just in the book of Matthew alone. I'll read to you from Matthew 4.10. Then Jesus say, then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, sake, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, him only shalt thou serve. So Jesus knew the commandment. That you should have no other gods before the Lord. That there was, you know, he's the only one you're supposed to worship. And we see other instances where men bow down to like the Apostle Peter, for instance. For instance, And he says, stand up, for I am a man as thou art. He refuses to worship because he understands. He, or, or Paul and Barnabas, you know, they, they bring the ox and the garland. And they're going to do sacrifice to him in the city. They, they, they had to stop him you know, in the book of Acts and say, don't worship us. We are just men. You know, they called one Jupiter and the other Mars. And they, they thought they were gods because of the things they were able to do. They, they had to stop them from sacrificing. So they understood. Anyone understood he should not have any other gods before he would refuse worship. They would say, don't do that. And Jesus here is refusing to worship the devil because he understands he is to worship God only. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and of course, it says in Matthew 28, verse 9, And as they went to tell to his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Now, that's some serious worship. Mm -hmm. And they're getting down on their hands and knees. They're grabbing him by the feet. You know, if you're going to grab somebody by the feet, you're not just going to bend over and do it. You're going to, you're going to get down there on that level. And uh, they worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. He doesn't say, Get up. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. He accepts that worship because he is God. Right. He's, He's able to take that. And then you can see more of that if you want to read through the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus time and time and time again receives worship as God because he is God. When you say, well, if he's not, if he's a created being, who do they say he is? And I've heard Jehovah Witnesses deny this next one. And it's it's right here from their webpage. They say that Jehovah that uh, Jehovah that uh, that Jesus Christ is the Archangel Michael. That's who they say is. this again, right off of their website. I'm not making this stuff up. You know, JWs they want to deny this stuff. I don't know why, you know, but it's right there on their website. 
Um, you know, if, if you're going to be a proud Jehovah Witness, you got to embrace this. You know, you can't run from it. This is this is who you are as Jehovah Witness. Uh, you believe that Jesus is a archangel. This gets, you know, when I started looking at this one, it was just like so mind-numbing. Um, I debated whether or not to get it. It's just, I seriously got a headache trying to write this sermon because it's, it's just, you understand why people would want to do that, uh, believe any of this. You know, so really this one is just too stupid to spend much time on. Um, but it's, again, just based solely on conjecture. They never cite, um, you know, uh, Joshua 5.13, which is interesting. Let me just read from the article. If you want to go and turn to Joshua chapter 5, we'll kind of blow through this one. I know we're kind of coming up on time here. It says here, who is the archangel Michael? The Bible's answer. Michael, referred to as by some religions as Saint Michael, is evidently a name given to Jesus before and after his life on earth. Evidently. I don't know what evidence they really have. They go on and say, well, Michael disputed with Satan after the death of Moses and helped an angel deliver God's message to the prophet Daniel. Michael live up, lives up to the meaning of his name, who is like God, by defending God's rulership and fighting for God's enemies. So, if, you know, apparently if you stand up for God and you help a man of God, or, you know, or if you, if you stand against the wiles of the devil, all of a sudden you become an archangel. So I wonder which one I am, because I, you know... I've, I've disputed, uh, you know, against the, the, the I, I withstood the, the, the devil's attacks, you know, and I've, I've, I've had the shield of faith, you know, I put on the armor of God, you know, uh, <clears throat> I've helped, you know, deliver God's message as a prophet, you know, like he did for Daniel, so I guess maybe I'm an archangel, you know, I don't know which one I am, they can call me Archangel Corbin, I guess, it doesn't really roll off the tongue, though, I'll just stick with Brother Corbin, but, uh, <clears throat> Then again, they just say, well, Michael is the archangel. Title archangel means chief of the angels. They say, well, who's chief of the angels? Well, it must be Jesus, right? Well, if you look at Joshua, they, didn't, and they, none of, they never sourced this. This isn't quoted there. They conveniently left this out in Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. And this is, of course, when Joshua's going into the promised land. He's about to take on Jericho. And he goes out in the morning. He's walking along the banks of the river. And this man appears unto him, the sword is hand. We'll look it up here in verse 13. And it came to pass. When Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there was a man uh, over against him with the sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Out thou for us or for our adversities? He said, Nay. I love that answer. You know that would, you know a lot of a lot of the patriotism today would kind of would do well to take heed of that today. But everyone that's just so you know I love this country, but everyone that's just so gun ho like America can do no wrong. That God's always on our side no matter what. Well, when Joshua here asked him, he said, are you for us or against us? He just said, nay. Like, neither. <laughs> like, he was trying to, Joshua was doing like the JW, is just that false dichotomy. Yeah. Hey, you're either with us or against us, right? And he's just like, actually, there's a third option. <laughs> neither. And he said, nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. So he's not, he's, you know, there, yes, there is an archangels, but there's also a captain of the host. And I believe that host would include not only the angels, would also would include saved believers, because you know, we're going to come with him as the Lord's host on white horses, and you know, and, and, and rule and reign with him. So you know, it's just it's just a chain of command in the Bible. You have the captain, the Lord's host. You have angels. You have archangels. You know, it's not you can't just say, well, he's the archangel. That must mean he's Jesus. That's literally the leap that they make to believe something as ridiculous as that. Um. <clears throat> And they probably don't want to cite Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 here, because it goes on and says, And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship him, and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now I recall another place where that where someone was told to lose the shoe off their foot because the, the place they stood was holy. And that's when God showed up in the burning bush with Moses. Right. So here you have Jesus showing up to Joshua. And the same thing happens. Just another proof that, uh, that Jesus Christ is God. Because you have a man bowing down and worshiping, and worshiping him. And, and, it, and Jesus, the captain of the Lord's host, even so embracing that worship that he goes so far as to, not only should you bow down and worship me, but why don't you take your shoes off? Because the place you stand on is holy. Right. So, uh, you know, that's probably why they conveniently left Joshua chapter 5 out of their article uh, concerning the, who Jesus is. You know, referring to him as the archangel Michael. But one of the last things, and I'll try to kind of get through this quickly. I've got more notes, but uh, Je Jehovah Witnesses, I've preached on this before, Jehovah Witnesses do not believe in a literal eternal hell as taught in scriptures. They do not believe 
and a literal eternal hell. And they quote some, some kind of crazy things about that. And they have a whole, this is one of their longer articles, the last one. What is, the, what is hell really? What is hell really? And it's crazy what they start to say here. Then this is their this is their logic. They say, well, you know, uh, the wages of sin is death. So when a person dies, their physical death, that pay, that wage is paid for. So there's no need for them to go to hell. And they liken out of hell and just to this like holding ground, where good people and bad people go. It's just like this waiting. It's just like a waiting room, you know. Basically, it's just like, you know, it's not as unpleasant. It's not fighting. It's, it's probably about as unpleasant as like a doctor's office, you know, the lobby where you gotta go read those stupid old magazines and stuff. That's what they're kind of likening hell onto. It's not paradise, but it's not that bad, you know. It, it'll get better, you know, once you see the doctor. But uh, that's kind of, they, that's what they say. And the reason that we say that is because, well, once you die, you know, death is the penalty for sin. So therefore, once you die, you pay dental, that's, uh, the, dental, uh, the penalty for death. We have to remember the second death, that there is a spiritual aspect to that death. Like when God told Adam in, in the Garden of Eden, the day thou eatest the tree of, uh, of good and evil, you know, the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And they did eat, didn't they? Did they die that day? Not physically, they died spiritually. That's a spiritual death that takes place. So we know, of course, you know, Revelation chapter 20 and 21, when the Bible starts to talk about the second death, when death and hell are cast in the lake of fire, this is the second death. So there is a, sec there is a spiritual aspect to the, the wages of sin, and it's called the second death, which is what we commonly refer to as going to hell. And you know, it's a doctrine that could probably be explained a little bit further, exactly what we mean by that, because it says death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. You're kind of getting into end times prophecy and stuff like that. But essentially, you know, they're going to come a time when they're cast into a literal lake of fire. You know, um, and it's not just this 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 waiting room that they want to make it into. And they uh, go ahead and turn to Psalm uh, chapter one forty six. Psalm one forty six. <clears throat> they go on and talk about uh, you know how God breathed into Adam the breath of life. Through breathing, sustained life, put breath, the breath of life in his nostrils, and much, much more than just simply blowing air into his lungs. And then that God put into Adam's lifeless body the spark of the force of life. There it is again, right? There's that Haryukin, you know, that he's, he's sending out. Which is actively in all Earth's creatures. This Bible refers to this animating force as spirit. Uh, it has no personality or, or no thinking ability. Now, I would disagree with that wholly. I, I believe that the spiritual man, the inward man, has, you know, personality. It, I mean, it's part of who you are. It has thinking ability. Um, it's the part of you that desires God. I mean, why do you see lost people just going and join? Why Why are there seven, you know, you know, what is it, a trillion Catholics in the world and a, however many millions of maybe even billions of Muslims in the world? Because there's a part of man, the spiritual side of him, the spirit part. It's dead, but that doesn't mean it's not doing anything. Yeah. It just means that it's not born again in Christ. It's not a new creature. It's the dead man. It's, it's a dead man walking, essentially. So to say it has no personality and no thinking, um, you know, I, I just disagree with that. But there, go to Psalm 146. Let me get over there in their, in their book here. Uh, and we'll, we'll kind of compare what they say with what the King James says. Because it says here in Psalm 146, verse 4, His spirit goes out and returns to the ground. On that day his thoughts perish. So it says his spirit goes out, but he goes back to the ground, and that day his thoughts do perish. So he says when a person dies, his impersonal spirit does not go on to exist in another realm as a spirit creature. It returns to the true God who gave it. And then they go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, and they try to prove from that that, uh, you know, that, that he, uh, it's, uh, it just goes on into this. We'll, we'll turn there in a minute, but going back to Psalm 146. It says there, you know, it says that his spirit goes out. Now, is that what it says in the King James? No. no. It says his breath goes out. Now, is that not a fact that his breath goes out? Let me get over there, too. Psalm 146. It says his breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. Yeah, I mean, his, his body's dead. That's what it's saying. Like, that's, he died. He quits breathing. That's what happens when a person dies. They quit breathing. Eventually, they decompose and their brain no longer functions. His thoughts perish. It's not saying that his spirit goes out. This impersonal and unthinking, you know, fo active force of God removes from his body. It says his breath. That's what the King James. So we start to see why and how important it is to have the right version of, of God's word and to trust it. 
And of course, you know, they go into uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, which is a lot of just... First of all, you got Solomon, who's, who's getting into a lot of sin in that book. He does a lot of things. I mean, the Bible often states what a person does, but doesn't always say that was the right thing to do. It just tells you what they did. You know, and, and you see Solomon, he's kind of going through, you know, his, I don't know, it was like a midlife crisis or what, where he's trying, you know, foolishness and drunkenness and gluttony and, and multiple, he just goes into all these different things. And so they're, that's where they turn to. They're turning to these books that, you know, they don't, uh, they don't, uh, you know, are necessarily the best place for, for to, to find a, a clear scripture that's going to help support your doctrine. They go to Ecclesiastes. Let's, for example, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We'll look at a few more things here. And they're just trying to make the case that, you know, oh, when you die, that your spirit leaves your body and goes back to God, and it, it's impersonal, and, and that, uh, you know, you just kind of wait out. You just hang out in hell <clears throat> until God, you know, resurrects you. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, let's look at verse 7. They say here, The dust returneth the earth just as it was, and the Spirit returns to the true God who gave it. So that's what they say. Well, you know, your body goes to the earth because you're created of dust, and that your spirit goes to God. <clears throat> and it does say that in Ecclesiastes 12. It says this, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return to the God who gave it. But when you read that in context, I mean, that's a very poetic passage. That's a very, Solomon's saying a lot of things throughout the Ecclesiastes. That's not, that's not a clear scripture of someone saying, you know, that you don't, that your spirit's an impersonal force, that there is no hell. I mean, somehow you, get, you go from that to saying there is no hell. They'll say things like, uh, since the dead have no conscience, that's really what they're driving at. This is where they're, you know, Ecclesiastes and Psalms, are, that's their, they're laying that foundation saying, and since the dead have no conscience, existence, right? Because your spirit goes to God and the dust goes to the earth. You have no conscious existence after death. Uh, hell cannot be a fiery place of torment because in order to experience torment, you have to be conscious of the fact, right? <clears throat> and they even go on and say, so Jesus was in hell. They say, well, Jesus, the Bible teaches that. It says that Jesus, you know, his soul was not left in hell. Right? That he suffers only when to see corruption. He uh, say, well, his soul was in hell. You know, so well, my question would be, well, did Jesus stop existing? Is that what they're saying here? You know, if going to hell is you not existing, not having a conscience, did his spirit return to God? So they use a lot of symbolism. They're using a lot of passages where they're just trying to lay this foundation and, and saying, well, that, you know, there can't be a hell because people aren't conscious of anything after they die. But the Bible is very clear that people are conscious after they die. And uh, <clears throat> they go to... Um, let me read this to you. It says, Could it be that hell, that the fire of hell is symbolic of all-consuming or thorough destruction? Separating fire from Hades or hell, as the scripture says, death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. The lake mentioned here is symbolic. So now being symbolic is, is incorrect. Before when we were in Psalms and Ecclesiastes, it was okay to use symbolic passages. It was always okay to use poetic passages. It was okay to use these, you know, these books of wisdom and, and, and psalms and, and songs and poetry. But now that we're in like the New Testament, mm -hmm. where it says death and hell were cast into a literal lake of fire. Oh, symbolic. That's right. Well, that's convenient. It's, it's <clears throat> Since uh, death and hell, oh, that were uh, and hell hades that are thrown into it cannot literally be burned. They're going to find out contrary people that, that believe this. They don't yeah. believe that Jesus is God. That that uh, are, you know. This is where it gets scary because now they're they're willing to damn people. To hell. Let's go ahead and turn over to Mark chapter 9. You know, this is a passage I read the other night, and, and this is a very powerful reminder about the reality of hell that Jesus preached. He said in Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9 and verse 43, he said, If thy right hand, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off, for it's better to be friend of the life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, the fire into the fire that shall never be quenched. Oh, that's figurative, apparently. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. I mean, what, what, what is the figurative there? What, what could that possibly mean other than what it says? And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off, for it's better than to enter in a life halt, than having two feet to be cast to hellfire, into the fire that shall never be quenched. I mean, why should... He's saying, oh yeah, so they believe that Jesus is saying you should maim yourself, because, you know, when you die, you don't have a consciousness. Hmm. It would be better for you to maim yourself than to go into a, 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 a... You know, to die and not have any consciousness. Does that make any sense? No. Jesus is saying you should cut, you should be willing to do this. 
you know, he's not saying do this, but he's saying, you know, hell is this bad that it would be better for you to pull out your eyes, to cut off your hands, to cut off your feet, than to go into fire that shall never be quenched, and where the worm dieth not. And he goes on and on there, and he says it over and over again. Verse 48, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. It's a literal place. And, uh, <laughs> but they're trying to say, well, it's all figurative, that it's not a real place. And then they go on and they say this crazy stuff. They said, on the other hand, those in God's memory who are in hell, the common grave of mankind, have a marvelous future. So when you go to hell, you have a marvelous future. <laughs> That's what the article said. I'm not even making it crazy. Sense. In the new world of God's making, resurrected humans who comply with, the, uh, with his righteous laws will never need to die again. Jehovah will wipe away out every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither will mourning, uh, neither will mourning or outcry or pain be any more. In fact, the former things will be passed away. What a blessing is in store for those in hell. Wow. That's what they say in the article. That hell is actually a blessing. Did you know that? Wow. You know, and if you, so if you want a night, night, you know, if you want the, a cold hell where it's not so bad, you just go to the ecumenical church. But if you want like a blessing hell, where hell is a great place to go, why don't you go over to the kingdom hall? You know, but if you want the hell that to be preached for what it is, what the Bible says it is, a place of fiery torment, mm -hmm. a place that people should avoid at all costs, mm -hmm. a place that we should go out and try to rescue others from, then you're in the right church. Because Amen. here we believe that hell is a literal place that people go to. Amen. Now, you say, how does anyone ever get, get, you know, and I know that last part was kind of a little choppy there, but let's just talk very briefly about the, the, the Jehovah Witnesses' uh, history a little bit. It says that, you know, what they are is basically, they're a cult, you know, going back in history. Jehovah Witnesses originated as a branch of the Bible student movement, which developed in the United States in the 1870s among followers of Christian restor restor restorationist Charles, minister Charles Taze Russell. And it goes on and says here um, that they had several splits. Their group took, uh, it goes on and says, Bible student missionaries were sent to England in 1881. So this, this is a recent cult. This isn't something that goes way back. I mean, it's 1800s. That's not that far back in recent history. <clears throat> and the first overseas branch was opened in London in 1900. The group took on the name International Bible Students Association, and by 1914 it was also active in Canada, Germany, Australia, and other countries. Countries that they got ran out of and were banned from for several, during World War II because they believe in uh, uh, nonviolence. They don't believe in participating in, in any of that, in, 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 in enlisting in the army. The movement split into uh, several revival organizations after Russell's death in 1960, with one uh, led by Russell's successor, Joseph Judge Rutherford, retaining control of both his magazine, The Watchtower, and his legal publishing corporation. So not only that, but they are they are founded upon the false teachings of a they, uh, they are founded upon the teachings of a proven false prophet. And it goes on and talks about the, the false predictions that were made in 1874 about Christ's return and that it never happened. False predictions even took place as recently as the 70s. I mean, we heard about, you know, the, the great disappointment is what they called it, that Jesus didn't come. And then they say, well, he did come, but nobody saw him. I mean, it was a secret coming. You know, which the Bible says, you know, if they say to you he's in the secret chambers, believe yeah. not. Yeah. Right? That's what Christ said. Well, they even had, did anyone know about they had false predictions even as recently as the 70s? I'll read this real quick. It says, from 1966, witness uh, publications heightened anticipation of Christ's thou uh, thousand-year millennial reign beginning in late 1975, repeating the 1925 cycle of excitement, anticipation, and then disappointment. Witness publications and convention talks intensified focus, uh, intensified focus on 1975 as the appropriate time for God to act, with statements that he, the immediate future is certain to be filled with climatic events, climatic events, Within a few years, at most, the final parts of the Bible prophecy relative to these last days will undergo fulfillment. The, sep uh, the September 15, 1971 issue of the Watchtower warned that all worldly career careers are soon to come to an end and advised youths that they should not get interested in higher education for a future that will never eventuate. So they're dissuading young people from going to getting an education. Don't even worry about your career. This is how serious they were back in the 70s. A chart, uh, a, a chart in 1971, Awake, indicated the thrilling hope of a grand Sabbath of rest and relief in the mid-1970s at the close of the 6,000 years of human history. 
Some witnesses sold businesses and homes, gave up jobs, deferred medical procedures, and set aside plans to start a family. <laughs> I mean, these are like major life events that they are so dedicated, they're just putting on hold because of what the Jehovah Witnesses are teaching them. <clears throat> and they did all that in anticipation of arri uh, Armageddon's arrival. The May 1974 issue of the Watchtower Society's newsletter, Our Kingdom Ministry, commended witnesses who had commended them for doing this, who sold homes and property to devote themselves to preaching in the short time remaining. <coughs> Watchtower literature did not state dogmatically that 1975 would definitely mark the end, and the buildup was tempered with cautions that there was no certainty that Armageddon would arrive in 1975. So that's not certain, but go ahead, you know, good job selling and, and quit your careers. And, and not having a family. It's not certain, but we commend you for doing that. <clears throat> but magazines warned that time is running out rapidly and that only a few years at most remain before Armageddon. Circuit assemblies in 1970 held a public talk entitled, Who Will Conquer the World in the 1970s? And it goes on and just talks about how their, their numbers went up and, and, and the people were getting baptized. And of course, 1975, uh, 1976, the Watchtower advised those who had been disappointed by the failure of the predictions for 1975. So 1975 comes and goes, and the world just keeps on turning. And they say, and so in the 1976, they adjust their viewpoint because their understanding had been based on wrong premises, they say. Isn't that convenient? Sorry about you not pursuing a career for those two years, or putting off your family, or that medical procedure that you needed. <laughs> you know, you know, sorry you've been suffering with that ailment for those, all those years. But four years later, after several proposals by governing body members to apologize to witnesses were voted down, they weren't even willing to apologize. Wow. The Watchtower Society admitted its responsibility in building up a hope regarding 1975. So at least the publication is like, yeah, we at least accept the blame, but we're not sorry about it. You know? Now Jesus, he specifically warned about these types of people, people that make false predictions. He said, and Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show signs and wonders, insomuch that it were possible they should deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore if they shall say unto you, Behold, these in the desert, go not forth. Behold, these in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even in the west, so also shall the Son of Man, the coming of the Son of Man be. And make no uh, mis uh, mistake about it, these guys are false prophets, and they are preaching a false Christ. A Christ who is not God, a Christ who did not die on a cross, but died on a stake, a Christ who is actually the archangel, Michael. These guys, they do not believe in the, the Christ of the Bible, but the King James Bible. They don't believe in it. It's a different Jesus. And, you know, they're making false predictions. That's what they do. Always oh, coming. And it's affecting people's lives. You know, it's, it's easy to get up and kind of mock these stupid articles and pick them apart a little bit and their, and their poor reasoning, but they're affecting real people. Yeah. And those people back in the 70s were, were affected, mm -hmm. you know, and, and this is kind of another thing that, you know, puts people off to Christianity, these, 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 these nuts and these crazies that want to come under the umbrella of so-called Christianity, and then they do crazy things like this, and people want nothing to do with religion as a result. And that's why God puts such a strong punishment on false prophets. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's serious. I'll read to you in Deuteronomy chapter 18. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Jehovah's Witnesses, guilty on both counts. They have presumed to speak a word in his name, which he have not commanded him to speak. They're saying, well, they're speaking lies about him, and they're speaking in the name of another god, a god who is an active force. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if that thing follow not, nor come to pass, you know, the great appointment, disappointment, when 1975 didn't come to pass, <clears throat> that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. That prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So, you know, I kind of, kind of a longer sermon this morning, but I do want to touch on a few important things about Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, hopefully we got enough out of there to at least make the conclusion that the Jehovah's Witnesses are a false cult, that they teach another Jesus, and that we should we should love the people that are involved in it, that are caught up in it, and try to win them back and help them to see that the errors and maybe you know something that was taught this morning will be something that you could put in your arsenal, you know, to, to in your in your Bible, your notes, whatever. That you if you ever run across these people, you can 
you know, uh, talk to them. You know, sometimes they're, they're so hardened and they're so involved, they're so entrenched um, that it's very difficult to pull them back out, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, maybe one day it'll be a blessing to somebody that we might be able to rescue out of that, that cult. So let's go ahead and pray.